So the next presentation is going to be given by Franco Egidi. The title is An Harmonic Ab Initio Calculation, uh, the calculation of Resonance Raman Spectra for Molecules in Solution. So uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to talk to you today about the things uh, that we do. And uh, I will be talking about uh, the, the calculation of resonance Raman spectra, in particular with the inclusion of an harmonicity and solvent effects. Just uh, two very quick words about this kind of spectroscopy. Well, resonance Raman is just like regular uh, Raman spectroscopy that everybody knows about. Uh, where you, uh, the only difference is that the incident laser frequency is in resonance with an electronic transition of the system. So you, as you do in regular Raman, you plot the scattered intensity with respect to the Raman shift to obtain the spectrum, or with respect to the incident frequency to obtain what is called the excitation profile. Now the real advantage of doing something uh, like resonance Raman is that uh, you get a huge enhancement of your uh, spectroscopic observable if you are in resonance with an electronic transition. And <clears throat> this enhancement allows you to do many things because if you have, for example, a chromophore which is embedded in a bigger uh, system such as a uh, biological molecule, you can tune your incident frequency to a specific chromophore and only certain vibrations which are close to the chromophore should be enhanced. So you get a simpler spectrum, a more focused one, and something that is, should be easier to interpret. Of course, the interpretation is not uh, trivial, and here's when, uh, where uh, calculations can be useful. Okay, so what do I need to actually compute the spectrum? Well, uh, to compute a Raman spectrum, I need the Raman polarizability. That is known. And the expression for the resonance Raman polarizability is written over here. So I have the initial and final states, vibrational states, I and F. I have a summation which runs over all vibrational states belonging to the excited uh, potential energy surface, M prime. And in the formula, I also see the um, vibrational energies of the states, the incidence frequency omega, where N gamma is a um, uh, damping factor. And I have the transition dipole moments for the electronic transition. So I just have to do this summation. Okay, so the first thing I need is a model to, for the two potential energy surfaces, the ground one and the excited one, so that I can find the vibrational eigenstates and do these integrals. So what one usually does is to employ the harmonic approximation for both of them, and, and therefore you get the harmonic uh, uh, oscillator eigenstates. You then expand the transition dipole moments in a Taylor series and truncate it wherever you like. Of course, the problem with this approach is that you have um, two different sets of normal modes, one for the ground state, one for the excited state, which are apparently unrelated. And in order to do the actual integrals, you have to find a relation between the two. And what one usually does is to employ the Dushinsky um, formula written here, where you essentially connect the normal modes of the excited state Q prime with, the, with those of the ground state Q, using this simple relation where J is a matrix, it's called the Dushinsky matrix, and K prime is a sh shift vector. So you compute these two from the set of normal modes and you can go on with your calculation. Now, this whole approach has been used in the past very successfully to compute the resonance Raman spectra. Uh, but we wanted to see if we could go beyond and tell uh, uh, something uh, more about this phenomenon. In particular, we wanted, since this is a, a kind of vibrational spectroscopy, we wanted to see what is the effect of the unharmonicity of the potential energy surfaces. Because it has been shown that for other uh, spectroscopies such as infrared or uh, vibrational circular dichroism, there can be a huge effect. So 
uh, this is the first thing. Then we wanted to study the effect of the environment. And finally, we wanted to see if we could do imp improve the scaling of the method so that it could go and be applied to bigger systems. So let's start with the anharmonicity. OK, what we do is to find the anharmonic frequencies of vibration for the ground state. This, uh, uh, the method for this, which we choose, is vibrational perturbation theory. And uh, this has been done for many years. Of course, it's a very expensive thing to do computationally. And if it is very expensive for the ground state, for the excited state, it's almost impossible. It's, a, it's very difficult unless you have a very small system. So what we instead choose to do is to do this for the ground state and then use the Dushinsky relation to estimate the excited state vibrational uh, frequencies. Uh, this way we can avoid having to compute them uh, ab initial. So let's see some results. I, I took this very simple uh, test mo molecule, imidazole, and I computed the resonance Raman spectra um, with and without anharmonicity effects. And you can see there is uh, the biggest effect that can be seen is a uh, shift of all the peaks, because of course the anharmonic frequencies are all lower than the harmonic ones. And there is also an effect on the intensities, on the relative intensities of the spectra, because of course uh, all these vibrational energies do go uh, into the formula for computing the polarizability. So this seems to be quite a relevant effect. And you can see somewhere, uh, in some places, there is a superposition of the peaks in the harmonic spectrum, but not in the anharmonic ones. So this effect can be very important, as it is to be expected. Let's move on to environmental effects. OK, what, the reason we wanted to do this is uh, because it has been known for many years that this kind of spectroscopy is heavily influenced by in the environment of the molecule. One of the reasons is that this is an intrinsically time-dependent phenomenon. In fact, it can be viewed as originating from the evolu time-dependent evolution of the starting vibrational wave packet on the excited state potential energy surface. So, we because of this, we must ask ourselves what happens to the solvent during, or the environment more in general, during this evolution. Does the, the environment stay fixed, or does it follow and evolve with uh, the solute, or rather, some, do some degrees of freedom of the solvent follow the evolution while others remain fixed? This is what uh, you may call the solvation regime. And we wanted to study this effect, how this influences the spectroscopic outcome. So we have to choose a model for this, and the model we choose is the polarizable continuum model, in which the molecule is placed within a cavity in a polarizable continuum representing the solvent, and there is a mutual polarization between the two. And if we want to analyze the solvation regime, you, we have to split the solvent polarization into different contributions according to the different uh, degrees of freedom. So let's go to the results for the same molecule, uh, this test case. I show the excitation profile uh, above and the Raman spectrum below. So the blue, dashed blue line is a solvent which uh, is fully at equilibrium with the solute. The orange dashed line uh, is what we call the, a fixed cavity, where the, the, the cavity of, of, uh, representing in which the molecule is placed is kept fixed. And then the green line is uh, a spectra obtained with a, sol with a solvent's uh, nuclear degrees of freedom fixed, while the electronic ones are, uh, let, uh, are allowed to equilibrate with the solute, essentially, without going too much into detail. So you can see there, is, there are some very important differences in, in, uh, in both the excitation profile and the Raman spectra. Um, there is, for in the Raman spectrum, for example, there is a shift in the in frequencies when I add uh, the fixed cavity or non-equilibrium effects. And, also, and there is also an, an effect on the relative intensities. So this is just to show that in addition to actually computing uh, the observable 
uh, for the molecule in a solvent or an environment, you also have to ask yourself what is the solvent regime or, um, and what happens to the environment during this uh, spectroscopy. So uh, the problem is, uh, and, and it, of course, it is not, it's by no means trivial to decide what uh, is the correct solvation regime because it may depend, well depend on the system, it may depend on many factors. So we wanted just to study and analyze what happens if we change things around. Of course, I've bragged about having to do biological systems and bigger systems, but I've only shown you imidazole. So we wanted to apply this method to something bigger, and we chose this chlorophyll in methanol solution. And Okay, so we computed all of the necessary parameters for the spectrum, and we computed the spectrum. Of course, this kind of method does scale somewhat badly with the system size, because you have to sum over a huge number of states. The good news is that uh, all terms in the summation are actually independent, so you can, if you have many processors, you can parallelize the computation. And this is, this is what we did, and we have a huge uh, increase in speed. In fact, the actual spectrum calculation is by no means the bottleneck of the calculation, and all that comes previously is much more expensive, and doing anharmonic spectrum for this molecule is uh, quite challenging because the anharmonicity part is the most expensive step, but it can be done and we, have, uh, we managed to do it. So this concludes my presentation and I would like to thank you all for your attention. Brilliant presentation, now we have time for questions. compares very well, actually, to use the Dushinsky method. It has been shown uh, in, uh, many times. And we also validated our approach for computing anharmonic frequencies of the excited state. We didn't just trust it out, so. You show the effect of the anharmonicity and the solvent on the smaller systems, where, of course, the normal mode analysis is a reasonable one. But I was wondering, when you move to larger systems, if you think of the process of the transition moment to be essentially due to the second order polarizability between the states, probably local modes would be a better way of looking at it. In other words, including an harmonicity within the normal mode analysis of a larger molecules may not be physically correct compared with the time of action or the transition moment. Maybe it would be interesting to look at uh, important variables and coordinates for making it a, norm, a local mode analysis. It may be an important effect, actually. Certainly, that would be very interesting, actually, because the normal mode picture itself relies on the rigidity, of, or somewhat on the rigidity of the system. If the system is very floppy, then a normal mode picture may not be accurate, let alone the anharmonic uh, uh, frequencies computed uh, on that. So. With floppy systems, this whole method um, is not directly applicable, but it, can be, it is possible and we would like to extend it and use, as you say, perhaps uh, more local modes and for those coordinates. Any more questions? No, it doesn't seem to be the case, so thank you very much again.